without further ado, we'll um, start with our speaker, Melody Rose Teague, who is the extension agent, is that right, Melody, and the Master Gardener leader for Green County. And she's been running a really interesting class on Mondays, Melody's Monday Musings, where she has just been stuffing our brains with the most incredible information. She's been, uh, she's been at Green County for how long have you been there, Melody? Since 2009. 2009. Yeah. And you're also on the uh, University of Tennessee Extension's Consumer Horticulture Team. And you're the current chair of the Fruit and Vegetable Work Group, director of both the Green County County Fair, Green County Fair Board and the Green County Historical Museum. And she's involved with the Tennessee Association of Agriculture Agents and Specialists. Tonight, Melody is going to talk to us about the Appalachian region. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Melody. All right. Thank you. And thank you all so much for having me. And, and uh, like Suzanne said, I've been doing these classes since um, about March the 30th. So if any of you have been attending those, you're going to get little snippets of about three of those kind of meshed together here this evening. Um, but I, I have been focusing a little bit on uh, the Appalachian region uh, because we are all a part of that region. And um, we always talk about planting the right plant in the right place. And, you know, oftentimes I think that goes back to just knowing where those plants evolve from, uh, what are native and that kind of thing. And so I kind of went way back and started looking at the region and found it, you know, some interesting things. And that's kind of how that evolved. So um, I do have an interest too in just the Appalachian region because I tell everybody it's kind of the trifecta with me because I grew up in Western North Carolina. I went to school uh, for undergrad in Kentucky, and then I landed in East Tennessee. So um, that's kind of how all of that worked out. Uh, but to get us uh, started tonight, I just wanted to um, bring that word to light about being uh, native, because we have really, well, we know that there's a huge interest there. And I think that we're going to start to see maybe this mentioned a little bit more um, as we move through 2021. And Suzanne was actually one that mentioned the, the pollinator pathway a couple of weeks ago and and some Zoom meeting we were we were a part of. Um, but we, we've not spent a lot of time as a state work group talking about natives, but uh, I think it's really critical to mention that. And um, as you're gonna see from tonight's presentation, uh, we have so many plants from our region uh, that are native that we can utilize in our home gardens and landscapes. And it's, it's quite phenomenal. Uh, but just to kind of make mention, when we do talk about uh, natives, they're not considered native to a region uh, with, within decades or even centuries after they're first introduced. Uh, they've got to originate into the region or co-evolve with other species in the regions uh, for thousands of years. So they basically just adapt uh, to the environment. So it's kind of like us if, if we move from place to place. We're always going to be a native to somewhere, but even though I'm a native Western North Carol Carolina gal, I'm, I still consider myself a native of East Tennessee because I've been here for so long. Uh, when we do talk about the Appalachian region, uh, we got to remember that um, we will often dub Appalachia, this area that you see highlighted here in red, more often uh, than not. It's going to be about a 1500 mile stretch, um, but we all know that the Appalachian chain is, is quite or much larger um, than that. But for tonight, we're going to focus a little bit more on the southern Appalachian and more specifically East Tennessee with a little bit of Western North Carolina tossed in there too because so much of that uh, does have a heavy influence where y'all are at um, as well as where where I'm at. Uh, this is just a map showing where a lot of our um, ancestry comes from. A lot of the plants uh, that we see today especially in our herb gardens would have uh, been brought from this area of northern Scotland and oftentimes you will you will hear some of those similarities. So just kind of remember that as we move through this evening as well. Um, again, Appalachian is gonna re refer to very different regions throughout this entire chain that you see highlighted here in the brown. And you'll notice that up there in the corner, we do have areas of Newfoundland off the coast of Canada that are also a part of the Appalachian chain. And you can kind of see that a little bit better here because in their entirety they're about 2,000 miles long and they're going to be the, the physical barrier that separates the coast from the vast interior lowlands of the United States. And again just to kind of show that just trying to frame tonight's conversation 
which I'm sure all of you are well aware of that, but even keep in mind if any of you have been to Nova Scotia, uh, Cape Breton Islands, that's a popular tourist location, all of that is included in the Appalachian chain as well. So the really cool thing about uh, the Appalachians is they, they're very old. They were formed about 480 million years ago and they were actually about as tall at that time as the Alps or the Rockies. And then they just, they have the domed shape to them more so than the pointed tops, uh, like our friends to the West, the Rockies, because just natural erosion that has occurred um, over time. Uh, the really cool thing is that um, the Appalachians were once an extension of the Caledonian Mountains, which are in present day Scotland and in Scandinavia. And you can kind of see that picture there. Kind of see how that stretches apart. So from the North American continent over uh, toward the UK and Europe there. Uh, what's also very cool to think about too is that uh, the Appalachians actually existed during Pangea when the continents all were forced together. Uh, the, Atlas, Atl the Atlas Mountains off the coast of West Africa in Morocco were actually also part of the Appalachian chain. So when we talk about geological differences, there's going to be a lot of similarities in Western Africa, um, in Scotland, in Scandinavia, um, very similar to our area here. So it was actually a, at one point you could actually walk from New York to Morocco or even from Florida to Sierra Le Leone, there was no Atlantic Ocean separating the two. And you can kind of see what that looks like there off the coast of West Africa. And this kind of gives you a little bit of a idea of what um, our Appalachians look like, except this is this bottom picture here is actually in the Atlas in Morocco. But you can see what we call these folds. It almost looks like you've taken cardboard and crammed those up together. And that's what happened when the continents kind of touched when they slammed into each other. And that's why we have all these vast interconnections um, separate or all these alternating ridge lines in the Appalachian. So y'all have all seen those if you've been atop Clingman's Dome or Mount LeConte, um, anywhere on the Smokies Ridge Line, you can look out and see how those cross over. And that's a result of that. That top picture is Ben Nevis in the Scotland Highlands. Um, also to just make mention about the rocks and how we know how old the mountains are and just maybe to give you an idea. When they were joined all together, um, we, once they broke apart, they left these remnants of the super continent and some of that rock is still exposed. So y'all are kind of close to, um, this is in Georgia, what's the name of that? Red, uh, Red Top, is it Red Top? Altoona Lake, y'all know what I'm talking about. There's a campground down there. But anyway, you can still see some of that rock exposed in that area as well as places along the Smokies Ridge Line at Chimney Tops. Uh, you'll hear that referred to as Anakista Rock. Um, even the road to nowhere, you'll see some of that um, rock there. And then as you move into the highlands of uh, Western North Carolina, up, up near Blowing Rock, we can see some of that metam metamorphic rock, which is what we call nice. And we have a lot of that, especially y'all um, down there in um, Hamilton County. Um, so that's one reason I put that in there. I'm not going to speak a lot about this, but if you're out and about and hiking, you're going to see a lot of this metamorphic nice rock formations. But to get to the fun of, of the Appalachian region, um, the Appalachians, especially the Southern Appalachians, we weren't technically um, affected by the glaciers themselves physically. Um, and you'll often hear us refer to the Southern Appalachian as being non-glaciated. And what does that mean exactly? And, and that just means that um, as glaciers occurred, basically everything slid off the mountain for lack of a better word and brought this huge hot seed bed. And that's why we have such a distinct uh, flora and fauna native. You see that in quotation marks um, to our area now. Um, but some of the species that technically didn't evolve here, but during the ice age, they were kind of brought here as a result of that was uh, some species of the red squirrel. And then 
also some different species of junipers. And even a lot of our plant species above that 5,500 foot, some of the firs, um, those were also, you often hear that referred to as a boreal forest or an alpine forest. And the reason for that is if you travel into the White Mountains or anywhere, you know, further north of them, way further north of the mason dixon line, that's, that's what that's termed. And that's a result of glaciers, even though we didn't have those glaciers here. But as a result, again, there's about 2,000 species of flora and 200 of those are going to be native and wholly confined just to the southern Appalachian area. It's a very um, complex interdependent system of plant growth. It's considered one of the greatest floral provinces on earth. And probably one that you all recognize would be up around Rhone Mountain, the Catawba rhododendrons, which are uh, native species to that area, as well as about 15 different species of mushrooms or fungi as well. When we talk about the Southern Appalachians or the Appalachians in general, uh, we're home to about 158 different species of trees. That's more than anywhere else in North America. And you'll see there deciduous oak and the coniferous spruce fir forest. And I just make mention of that because where y'all are at and as well as where I'm at, we get to take advantage of these um, ecosystems, uh, probably more so than really anybody else in the state. So it's really cool to be able to just walk outside and look around and be able to, to see some of that. Uh, we're, we're unique in the Southern Appalachian too, because we do have the highest peak east of the Rockies at 6684. This is in the Black Mountains, which is a sub range of the Appalachian Mountains right, right outside of Asheville, uh, which is Mount Mitchell. So some of you have probably seen this in chapter two of your, um, in or of your, training books. Uh, we included that a few years ago when we redid the handbook because we thought this was really important, uh, you know, to be able to share some of these different um, ecosystems um, across the state. Uh, but I just wanted to make mention of some of those and put a, a few plants, kind of put that in, in perspective a little bit for you. So when we talk about the Appalachians, uh, we mentioned a temperate rainforest. Uh, many folks that are not native to the area don't realize that, you know, we, we are, in fact, especially Mount Leconte, that area, again, is uh, referred to as a rainforest. So it's not always the Brazilian rainforest that, that we speak of when we use that terminology, because there's about 135,000 square um, miles of forest land that would fall into this category. Um, annually, the precipitation is going to be about 60 inches. Um, some years it's going to be a little bit more than that. But again, fir is going to be that dominant species um, at the higher elevations. And again, just to make mention of that great floral uh, province, the Appalachian forest, again, is highly complex. Um, there's about 10,000 species, both flora and fauna, that make their home in, in this temperate rainforest. And to kind of segue in from there into the Appalachian Blue Ridge Forest, um, that's a pretty large ecosystem. Um, this is where most of your mixed um, mixed tree forest biome is going to occur. Uh, you got about 62,000 square miles. Um, it's going to be one of the world's uh, richest temperate uh, regions for deciduous trees anywhere, which is going to bring with that so much more biodiversity in terms of flora and and fauna again. So some of the species uh, that we would have seen, we don't see that anymore, but the American chestnut, because of course black killed it out and at the turn of the century in 1904. Um, but again, chestnuts have always been a curiosity and remained a huge uh, part of our history when we talk about uh, the Appalachian forest. Um, this one's one that only you and Harold County are gonna be fortunate enough to uh, see because this is the yellow honeysuckle or the yellow wild honeysuckle. It's only native to um, Hamilton County from all accounts that I can find and that's also going to be part of that um, Appalachian forest. Uh, we do have bogs within the Appalachians. Um, sometimes you'll hear these referred to as fins, F-E-N. Uh, there's one just right up the road from me in Shady Valley, Tennessee. They actually have a cranberry festival there every year. Um, these are slowly kind of getting smaller and smaller every year, but still kind of cool uh, to think that they do actually coexist um, here in the mountains. 
Uh, one of the biggest uh, ecosystems that we have are the Appalachian coves. Many of you are going to recognize probably um, this from the Cades Cove. Um, probably closer to you would be like uh, Miller's Cove, Grassy Cove, um, Tuckaleechee Cove, Wares Valley. All of those would be term cove. Basically, that means that um, you're you just have a valley in between two ridge lines, and it's closed at either one or both ends. Is is what the uh, terminology is there. Sequatchie Valley, that would be another cove. And to go along with the coves, you do have the cove forest. Um, usually that's going to be anything below that 4,400 um, foot um, in elevation. And that's going to be primarily your des deciduous um, species. And we're going to have a lot of species that are going to be native to the southern Appalachians that reside within these cove forests. And you're going to recognize a lot of these species, the maples, the birches, the beech, the ash, um, which we're starting to see those decline as well, but magnolias and hickories and then um, even the eastern hemlock uh, falls into this category as well. Um, silver bells, redbud trees, a lot of the rhododendrons, flame azaleas. So this is going to be one of um, the most noted ecosystems within the, the Smokies, or I mean within the Appalachians and the Great Smokies um, there is about 72,000 acres of this old growth forest that do reside within the, within the park. Uh, this is where you're going to find some of those mixed forests. Again, um, you're going to be able to tell the north from the south, depending on the, the ridge line and what grows there, basically. Um, this is where you're also going to find a lot of um, the spring ephemerals and some of those woodland bot botanicals that we speak a lot of, uh, golden seal, ginseng. You're going to find a lot of the native trilliums and the native orchids um, throughout the forest floor in these co-hardwood um, forest. And then to kind of go around, we have the Appalachian bald, and we have two different kinds, the heath and the grassy balds. The big difference there is grassy balds are grassy. The heath balds are going to have uh, some low shrubs, um, so think about those. Again, the rhododendrons. Anytime we've got blueberries, that would be considered heath balls. And that's typically what we'll see growing on those. And then the spruce fir forest, again, that's going to be elevations above 5,500 foot. Um, that's just going to be elevations where it's really too cold to support any kind of broadleaf deciduous type tree. So we will often refer to the spruce fir forest as being a relic of the old ice age. So even within the Southern Appalachian, we've got about hundred square miles. Um, and it is considered an endangered um, ecosystem within the United States. So um, again, this is where the he balsams and the she balsams are going um, to reside. The red spruce being the he balsam and the Fraser fir being the she balsam, just as an FYI. Uh, just to make mention before we bring it on south uh, to where we are, um, Davy Crockett was one of those, or maybe Crockett, listen to me, Daniel Boone was one of those that was responsible for paving the road west, if you will, the Wilderness Road. Um, he basically was the one that discovered the Cumberland Gap. So um, as the Great Migration started occurring, um, we already had many settlers in this area where we are, um, but when they discovered the gap, that was one of the movements west when it really started happening um, back in 1775. But again, to speak a little bit more to the plant life, and um, we feel like this number is actually much larger than this, but 6,374 documented plant species have been found within the Appalachians. And again, some of the ones most noted are those azaleas and rhododendrons. Many of you know Jack in the Pulpit, the Columbines, um, any of those bog laurels, wood nettles, Queen Anne's Lace, which was just really a showstopper this summer for whatever reason. They just seem to be very prolific in, in blooming this year, um, as were the, the asters this fall. Uh, but to move into some of the specific stories of some of these plants, uh, this is the passion flower, which is one of our Tennessee state flowers. Um, this was actually discovered in South America in the 16th century by Christian missionaries. Um, but it, it kind of tells a story as many of the plants within our 
Southern Appalachian region do. So uh, when they first brought this over, they saw it as being a symbol of Jesus Christ because it was the first flower that they saw on their journey and they saw that as a good sign. So they were even able to describe that they thought the five sepals and the five petals of the passion flower represented the 10 disciples, um, minus Judas and Peter. And then that double row of filaments or the corona that you see pictured there, that was to represent the crown of thorns that Jesus was made to wear on his head. And then the vines, um, these little tendrils that you see here uh, represented the, the whips that they used to scourge Jesus. Um, another plant that um, has its fill of stories is the goldenrod. Um, this was a plant that Native Americans loved. It was very bountiful, still is in our cove hardwoods, um, but um, this was one that the seeds were actually utilized as a, as a food source. And of course, herbal teas are still made with this today, but um, this, is, this is one that gets a bad rap. Everybody sees this blooming in the fall and they think that it's ragweed, um, but it's very different from ragweed. Ragweed has a uh, really, or this one, goldenrod has a really sticky pollen and it can't be blown or dispersed by the wind uh, like ragweed. So this one is actually um, what most, again, of our Native American populations and early settlers deemed uh, a healthy and useful plant. And that's what the ragweed looks like. Yeah. Um, another one, this is um, an herb that derives its name from the Cree. Uh, Pipsiskawiu, which literally means break into small pieces. Um, I don't call it that. I just call it wintergreen because it's so much easier to say. But it is a dainty little flower as you're hiking along a trail. Um, it often gets overlooked because it might not be quite as showy as, as some of its um, counterparts. Um, but it does have a really cool, you can see that pinkish white um, flower and it looks face down. So it's still used as a flavoring in food today for candy. And again, Native Americans and, and our early settlers, they called this Prince's Pine, uh, Prince's Pine and utilized it for a wealth of um, all kinds of wound cleaners and things like that. Chicory, this is a plant many of you probably recognize. Um, this was cultivated 5,000 years ago. Probably what most people would recognize it's used for as being a substitute uh, for coffee, chicory coffee, and especially um, in areas of Louisiana. Many cafes only serve chicory instead of coffee, so it has a really uh, cool story to it as well. You can see there, um, even Horace wrote, as for me, olives, endives, and mallows provide sustenance, and uh, we feel like he was referring to chicory. Uh, many of you probably recognize this plant as being ramps or our native wild leeks. They are native to the eastern North American Appalachians. Uh, you're going to find those growing in patches of rich, moist um, cove hardwood uh, forest. They're going to pretty well extend the entire spine of the Appalachian Ridge from Canada all the way into to Alabama. Uh, the cool thing about these, again, is that when we see these being um, harvested is is early in the spring. And the reason that they were touted as such a remarkable plant is because it was one of those first spring greens to emerge. And Native Americans and early settlers used it as the tonic, basically to get the blood flowing again uh, from, a, from a hard cold winter. But you can kind of see uh, just some various pictures there. When you do harvest, this kind of goes back to golden seal and Jen saying um, you want to be careful. A lot of folks will harvest the entire plant, but the leaf actually tastes just like the bulb. So when you harvest, take one leaf and leave it so they can continue to spread just like those nuisance wild garlics in our lawns. They uh, spread and divide, multiply, very similar to that. So um, I guess I'm just saying I'm encouraging folks to just be cautious when you are harvesting because this is one that's starting to decline as well. So ramps are pretty well native to here, and much like the ramps, if you travel further north um, into the green in the White Mountains, uh, fiddleheads are considered a delicacy there. You will also find these here in the southern Appalachian, just not quite as prolific um, because there are some lookalikes. 
Uh, you got to make sure that this is the ostrich fern, but it is again considered a delicacy even in places Iceland, the Netherlands, um, Greenland, but it's a very short window to be able to harvest these, but they taste a lot, a lot like asparagus, a um, little bit of an earthy green uh, flavor. So that kind of brings us to ethnobotany and Appalachians. And I just wanted to mention this term because as you've noticed probably already, I've been speaking a lot about the relationships from uh, the region and the people and the plants and how all that kind of intertwines. And that's basically what ethnobotany is. It's just the study of those interactions and relationships of people and plants over time and space. So it's just being cognizant of the fact that, you know, many of us um, really promote recycling and taking care of the environment. It's kind of like that, but in the plant world, you know, we want to be uh, really cognizant of, of when we are out in the woods, whether we're wild foraging, whether we're hiking in the woods and we see a plant we like, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily want to dig that up and take it home because uh, believe it or not, these plants have a defense mechanism oftentimes built into them anyway. So if you do that, they're just going to protest and not grow for you, especially some of those wild orchids like the lady slippers and such. So um, I'll just caution you um, on that, but that's basically what ethno, ethnobotany is. It's just an avenue of preservation for us to be able to utilize and then pass that on uh, for generations to come. Uh, so when we do talk about some of those common plants, um, what are some additional ones of those, you know, when we look back to the history books, you know, one of the, the things we think about are fruit trees, like you see pictured here, but I think I actually shared this Monday night, you know, apple trees were not native uh, to the U.S. Those were brought over, but we did have wild fruit trees like the plums and the cherries. Um, but yeah, the peaches and apples, they weren't native to the area. Um, but anyway, these are still species that we'll see. Uh, many pioneers and, and homesteaders, they would journal where they saw these once they moved into the area. So if something were to, you know, happen to them, then the generations after them would be able to go back and, and find these locations, uh, whether it be fruit trees or any of these uh, useful plants. Um, that way it was kind of preserving and then passing that knowledge on for generations to come. Um, this is one maybe some of you recognize. This is the, the club moss plant. Um, and this is actually what uh, midwives, granny women or doctors back in the day would coat their hands with the spores of the club moss, which is like a podium powder, um, because it was considered to be an antiseptic. It was a very sterile um, plant. And today, you know, it's, it, or years ago, it was basically what, you know, we used uh, to cover our hands before any kind of surgery or anything like that uh, was performed. Uh, the cool thing too, is just recognizing again, those relationships. So this plant here is, is a spring ephemeral. We refer to it as hepatica, but the old name for it was liverwort because it kind of looks like, um, the leaf looks kind of like a liver. And um, of course, wart is the old English for herb. So anytime you see that, that's what that means, just as an FYI. But um, the plant looked like the, the liver and oftentimes the Native Americans or the early pioneers would call plants by what they look like or by what they would help heal in the body. So this is a great example to show, you know, that hepatica is one, it looks like the liver, but it, it was also utilized to treat liver ailments. And just as an FYI, it belongs to the uh, buttercup family. Same way with blood root, it's Latin is sanguinaria. And if you've ever cut open blood root, I thought I had a picture in here and I must not, but if you've ever cut that open, it looks like blood oozing from, from the stem. So um, plants weren't just used for medicinal uses. The natives actually utilized this as a, as a war paint. It was utilized as a dye. Um, they would also use it for medication though. They believed it treated rheumatism and, and even uh, would help break fevers and use it as an oral antiseptic. Uh, sassafras, uh, this is one that was revered by the American Indians and the early settlers because it was basically um, America's first toothbrush, if you will. So the toothbrushes we know today were a little bit harder on the gums than, uh, than they are today. 
Uh, butterfly weed, sometimes you will hear this called pleurisy root. So it's not just a great pollinator plant. Uh, it earned its name for pleurisy again because it was utilized to treat uh, lung ailments. Um, the blue cohosh and the black cohosh both are um, woodland plants, woodland botan botanicals that we'll see often on the trail. Um, they're both going to stand out pretty vividly, um, you know, throughout the forest, but they were both utilized uh, to treat women's ailments and conditions. Again, it's going to be a couple of those plants and you'll, you're probably already starting to see those relationships that some of these are used in our modern pharmacopoeia, if you will. Kind of see some different pictures there. Same thing with ginseng, um, different kinds of ginseng. I mean, folks will actually try to plant this. It's actually being cultivated in places in, in Western North Carolina now, but um, depending on contracts, I mean, you can, you can make good money on harvesting this, but you've got to be careful that you're um, growing the right kind and harvesting the right time, uh, right kind. You don't want a Korean ginseng. You want the Pax quinquefolius. But again, we're starting to see more issues with poaching with some of these plants. Um, I've already talked about Queen Anne's lace. Uh, this is what we will often refer to as the wild carrot, um, but it has a reputation for being able to um, heal kidney stones. So the wild root was taken in small amounts, just the right amount. There's a fine line there to be able to cure some of those digestive ailments as well. And then of course, some of those, what we refer to as weeds in the springtime, they're starting to germinate now, those winter annuals, the hen bits and the dead nettles and chickweeds, all of those are um, early spring greens and the first settlers in the Southern Appalachians really loved and valued these plants. Uh, same thing with elderberries, we're gonna see probably um, an increase in this as we start to move through the flu season or the COVID season. Uh, a lot of folks will start dragging out the elderberry syrup and the fire cider. Um, all of those are going to be made from various herbs, whether they be purchased or wild foraged uh, to be able to help um, increase the immune system's capacity to fend off viruses. So we'll see how well that, that works this year. Uh, plantain, if you've attended any of my classes, you hear me talk very highly of this one. Uh, this is one that has spanned the, the test of time, if you will. Um, it, is, it is a very bountiful herb or bountiful weed, depending on how you look at it. Uh, you'll notice there that the Saxons considered it uh, one of their nine sacred herbs in Gaelic. It was considered uh, to be known as the healing plant because it had so many, so many healing um, properties. So Lots of different uses for this plant, lots of different um, types of plantain. And you'll notice there that it's been found to be an eliminator of heavy metal toxins from the, from the body as well. Um, thyme is one of those um, trifecta herbs. We've got Thanksgiving coming up and this was one of the three that was utilized in uh, the first Thanksgiving, if you will. It's a pretty hearty, hearty herb and it uh, produces those really pretty white uh, blooms. So it can also be a great pollinator. It'll continue to grow even into the frosty weather. Um, but this is one that's considered an antiviral as well as an antibiotic. So a lot of folks would crush the, the thyme leaves and use it basically as a, as a pol poultice and it would do the same as a Band-Aid, help draw out infection. It's also uh, really good for bad breath. Uh, many people will forget or neglect the pine tree and just how important they are as an herb. Uh, many people will, will term a pine as an herb because it is uh, one of the old time uh, remedies for coughs, still used in cough drops and um, sore throat lozenges, especially when you mix it with um, honey or even salt and steep it into a tea. Um, if you've ever dealt with the bloat, then um, it's not about being pregnant. It's just because you've eaten too much and something's blowed you up. But if you can get your hand on some burdock root, which again is going to be one of those prolific plants, 
if it's allowed to get the little seed heads, it'll stick to anything. So it's pretty sneaky in how it reproduces itself. Um, but burdock was another one of those that um, our Native Americans and early ancestors really utilized frequently. Same with chamomile. Uh, the German chamomile would be the one uh, to consider here as far as making tea. Um, many of the early settlers thought it was superior even as a flavoring agent uh, to salt. Uh, this is one that you're gonna see pretty frequently. Um, any of the Minarda species, uh, you're gonna hear this probably called a lot of different names. Uh, Oswego tea plant, bee balm, um, but it was named after the Oswego Indians in, in New York. And then the Shakers also had some uh, defining role in naming this plant. But this is one that's used pretty frequently in a tea to help alleviate sinus pressure. And it's also used in the perfume industry. So again, you can see multiple uses for a lot of these plants. Another one that many consider a weed is the dandelion, uh, it, but in a highly concentrated tea, uh, it's a very good relaxer. It's like a substitute for opium. Uh, it can also relieve digestive issues. Uh, lemon balm is going to be one of those. It spreads pretty prolifically in the landscape, but if you turn or make that into a tea, it's really good for any kind of stomach issues. Um, whorehound, many of you probably know, is still utilized in a cough drop. Um, it is in the mint family, so it's going to be one of those that spreads really rapidly too, but it's also what we call a moonlight flower if you have a moonlight garden because of that grayish white foliage. So we're starting to see a little bit higher occurrence of some of these plants being grown just for that purpose too. Here's another one of those early herbs, uh, sage. A lot of folks just think, hey, this is what seasons the turkey and the dressing. Um, but it was actually utilized long ago as a lozenge to cure sore throats. And then marshmallow. If you um, are wanting to get started growing herbs, there's many modern day herbalists that will put this plant on their top 20 because it is a mucinologous plant. It produces that mucus. It's a wet plant, um, but it does grow in swampy wet areas, but it, you know, it has a pretty storied history as well as, as well. It belongs to the, in the same family as uh, cotton, okra, hibiscus, um, and you can utilize it uh, to make different kinds of tea as well. If you've ever gotten poison ivy, enough said about jewelweed, um, this is often going to be grown very closely. So where if you ever see poison ivy, you're probably going to see jewelweed somewhere close. Um, this is what we also call the wild touch me not, wild impatient, uh, wild impatience. You've got the yellow and the orange color. But um, again, if you can get your hands on jewelweed, it's an excellent uh, cure all for poison oak or poison ivy. And then oxalis. Um, used even today for, for burns. Uh, same way with calendula. This is one that you'd put up there with um, the plantain in a country. It's got great anti-inflammatory uses, often used in a salve. Uh, same, th um, same thing with echinacea or our cone flowers. And then anything that belongs to the allium, um, there are a defense mechanism built in. So if you grow these as a companion plant in your garden, it's gonna help repel a lot of pests, um, but they also have great antibacterial properties and can also be utilized as an expectorant. As far as the larkspur, um, we've got some folks that are starting to grow this as a cover crop. It's really pretty. It serves as a nice pollinator, um, but it does have a use as well. Um, it was often used as a wound astring astringent and also basically to clean the insides out too. Uh, yarrow is not just a pretty plant, it comes in different colors, um, but again this is one of those plants that tell a story. This is one that was utilized for blood clotting purposes years ago. So uh, many of the plants that you've seen so so far they weren't necessarily grown to be pretty in their gardens, in their in their landscape of course they were used in a pragmatic um, and practical approach to be able to cure everyday ailments, um, you know, on the homestead. 
Cotton even has some unique um, uses. You could utilize that, of course, for um, bandaging. You could utilize it for even splinting. And um, a tea was utilized to actually treat uh, mosquito bites and malaria. We have plants that were used as substitutes for soda and starch and sugar. So corn cobs were cooked down and utilized to make a dough, preferably red cobs. Um, if they needed salt, we had this question Monday night um, because salt was one of those um, commodities that needed to be imported during the first colonies here. And somebody asked, why not use salt out of the ocean? Um, and eventually they did have their own method of salt because they would dig um, dirt floors where they had actually um, had the smokehouse and they would boil that that soil down from where that salt, from the, where the meat had dripped into the floor. And they would utilize that as a, as a source for salt too. Um, for sweet tea, they would actually take up um, or take dried peaches. They would, when peaches started being imported, they would cut those up and let them dry. And that's what they would use to make sweet tea. Again, plants were utilized for various purposes. So many were used for dye, for linens. Um, they would fade over time, but they would just reutilize some of the plants. Some of those that you see here are uh, myrtle was used to make a gray color, especially um, for some of the con Confederate uniforms. The indigo bush, of course, has a gorgeous blue dye. Pokeberries, um, those are very toxic. Uh, to us as humans, but they make a, a great dye and they're good food for the birds too. And then even sweet potatoes could be utilized um, as a putty. So back in the day, settlers would actually cook this down and um, when the mash was hot, they would mix it with flour and, and use that to uh, mend any kind of pitchers or housewares that had like a hole or anything like that in it. And another plan, if you're ever lucky enough to be hiking and see these, that's pretty cool. Uh, these are what we call Indian pipes. They don't require photosynthesis, hence the reason they're white, um, but they'll even leave their stature throughout the winter months. So it's a really cool plant to be able to see. Um, most would consider this a parasite. And then of course, when we talk about the Appalachians, we always talk about the mints and we've got native uh, picanthemum species of mint. This here is the mintha piperita, which is not native, um, but that's usually what you're gonna have in, in the flavoring for modern day candy. But the old timey mint, the old mountain mint, this is what that looks like here. Um, I always like to talk about the humble may apple. Many of you have probably heard me mention that before, but um, the may apple is another one of those that we see blooming in the springtime. You can see the fruit there, see what the flower looks like. Um, but there'll be large colonies that exist uh, within the forest floor of these. But uh, this has really come a long way in modern day um, pharmaceuticals now being evaluated as cancer treatments, um, but again, their history goes way back uh, to the Native Americans. They utilized um, every part of this plant in some form or, or fashion. You can see there that uh, the actual fruit itself was used as a, as a laxative, or that first picture you saw, it was helped to remove warts. Uh, this is one that's really been touted in the last few years, the St. John's wart. It's known as the Prozac of Europe. Uh, that's been brought here. This is another one of those plants that would be on the top 20 um, herbs to grow if you're growing your own uh, pharmaceutical, if you will. Um, but this is, um, again, good on the, on the mood, if you will. Uh, the witch hazel, and it does need to be the Hamamalus virginiana, which is the native species, because there are some different cultivars, but this is where a lot of the modern day astringents uh, come from that ladies use in their morning and evening um, rituals, bath rituals, um, a, a toner, if, if you will. And then just to talk a little bit about some of these plants that we see, some of the, the poppies growing, um, we get 
lots of good uses from some of those, the codeine or the, the morphine. Uh, some of these, um, again, modern day pharmaceuticals are really starting to rely on these uh, natural remedies that Indians had known for years and starting to utilize these now in modern day medications. Uh, golden seal is one of those. Um, berberine, it's one that's going to lower your blood pressure and um, for irregular heart beats. Um, Vaseline, it's a vasodilator. It's good for blood sugar and, and um, blood cholesterol as well. And then lobelia, this is one that was blooming pretty prolifically for me, even up until a couple of weeks ago, but um, this is also called Indian tobacco, um, but it's one that's actually utilized in some of those over-the-counter nicotine uh, suppressant to help you get to, to break the habit. Uh, we already talked about blue cohosh. This is the black cohosh, again, used in many of our modern day products. And then I can't talk about uh, anything without bringing tobacco into to play, but imidacloprid um, is a synthetic form of nicotine. So tobacco was, I guess, uh, something that kind of gave us some of these modern day insecticides, if you will. So um, again, Native Americans utilized this years ago, they would grind up uh, the leaf and use that to sprinkle around in the garden to be able to, to rid the garden of, especially like aphids and thrips and the little bugs like that. Whoops, I got May apple in here twice, y'all. Sorry about that. And then uh, valerian, this is another one that's kind of similar to St. John's wort. It can get really, really big and prolific, but um, it is one that's very useful in the home uh, herb garden, as well as vinca. This is one that you're going to see um, um, venoblastine. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Vena, venoblastine. Um, this is in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Is what they're treating treating with, and that is all derived from the vinca plant. There's actually about 54 different cancer treatments now being studied just from this one plant alone. So it's pretty cool to know that a lot of our modern day pharmacopoeia is coming from plants of the Southern Appalachian region from years ago that our ancestors and the Native Americans here knew long before any of us. Uh, same way with the lady slipper, even though it's beautiful, it does have its, its own use. Um, they would utilize this often for women's issues and childbirthing. Uh, midwives love this plant uh, for that purpose. And then violets, if you all have seen some of Natalie's wildflower walks, you know she has a very prolific stand of violets in her backyard. Um, but violets were often seen just like the ramps were. They were seen as a springtime tonic. Uh, they were an anti-cancer uh, folk herb and a pulmonary remedy back in the day. Um, for early settlers, just as the stinging nettles are uh, today. Uh, stinging nettles are also considered a blood builder. So if you have low blood, um, many, many folks, even modern day, uh, will sip nettles tea to help build their, build their blood up. And then of course, um, cane berries, um, our fruit and veggie team is making a push you know, this year and next year into more fruit uh, specific uh, content. So cane berries is one of the uh, fruits we're gonna be focusing on. And of course, uh, some of those species existed here long before uh, we did and were a great source of sweetness um, to our early settlers and our Native Americans. And they have a lot of uh, nutritional value as well. And even the leaves can be utilized as well. So that kind of, that's going to wind me up, but that kind of gives you a little bit of a synopsis of the Appalachian region, some of our native species to the area, um, some of the different ecosystems and how they evolved through the years and how they were um, utilized, some of their stories. And there's a lot more to that. If you want more information all the, on all that, I've got a lot of material. And so the transmission of knowledge occurred between Native Americans and the early settlers or the early pioneers to the area. And most of that was through communication with the granny women or granny witches, um, as they were termed, not witches by modern day terminology, 
um, but true gran granny women. Um, they were the ones that held all the knowledge from the, from the plants that they brought with them from the old world to the new world. And then they kind of worked in tandem with the Native Americans and kind of compiled all this knowledge together. And um, of course, the Native Americans had access to so much more uh, plants and so many of these were new uh, when the settlers first arrived. But with the plants that they brought, they were able to kind of mesh all those cultures together and they intermingled. And that's kind of where, where we are today as a result. Hey, Melody. Uh, Ron McKittrick again. Uh, I was just wondering, you mentioned Vinca and Queen Anne's Lace, and uh, are they considered, uh, uh, I know there's a lot of different common names and that kind of stuff, but are, aren't they considered invasive uh, species now in, in Tennessee and taking over, taking over other habitats? Yes, especially the periwinkle or Vinca minor. Absolutely. Um, it is on the invasive species list. Queen Anne's lace, I don't think is on that list, but it, it has been known to, I mean, it is, well, not just Queen Anne's lace, but the water hemlock, the poison hemlock, all of those species combined are starting to take over some native habitats. So we don't want to be cultivating them for great purpose. I accidentally brought uh, Vinca here when I moved 20 years ago from my grandmother's because nothing I have here, I purchased anywhere. It's come from home or the farm or friends or something like that. And it's like, why did I do that? I'm still fighting it. I've been fighting it for 10 years now. And I realized that that is not a cool plant to have in my landscape. The plants or the herbs that they brought from the old world, we had species in existence here, but they were just different from what they brought. And also in, um, when we start talking about the great migration, um, think about some of the plants that we brought from Africa and they weren't able to get into trade because of how they were brought here. So okra, um, yams. Thank you, Melody, so much. Well, thank y'all for having me. Thanks y'all. Sure. Thank you.